Hello, my name is Stuart Taggart. I am the principal of Grenatech. We are a research advocacy focused on studying the viability of a pan-Asian energy infrastructure. In the next few minutes, I'll be outlining this vision. It's big and inspiring. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us. We'd love to hear from you. Now, let's get started. By 2050, Asia could be connected by a renewable energy delivery infrastructure stretching from China to Australia. This pan-Asian energy infrastructure would ease the flow of clean energy up and down the hemisphere. It would serve a market of 2 billion people. The benefits would include lower energy prices, increased supply security, and greater geopolitical integration. It would provide a durable solution to reducing regional greenhouse gas emissions through innovation and trade. This video will explain how it can be done. When we talk about Asia, we're talking about China, Japan, South Korea, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation States, East Timor, Papua New Guinea, and Australia. These 16 countries represent the world's fastest growing regional economy. In coming years, Asia will replace North America and Europe as the world's largest economic bloc. That's a major power shift. At present, Asia emits roughly one-third of global greenhouse gas emissions. This percentage will rise if Asia's economy continues to grow without taking action. Asia needs infrastructure of virtually every kind. Asia needs roads. Asia needs rail capacity. Asia needs air transport links. Asia needs more telecommunications capacity, new gas pipelines, and more extensive electricity networks. This new infrastructure is essential to Asia's continued economic growth. This infrastructure will cost trillions of dollars to provide. It will impact the efficiency of Asia's economy for decades to come. The smart thing, then, is to configure this infrastructure for the long term. Given the dominant role that Asia is now assuming in the global economic and political order, the decisions Asia makes about new infrastructure and the climate change implications these will have will largely determine what life is like in the second half of the 21st century. That's because everything in Asia is big. The size of its population, the size of its collective economy, the size of its economic growth potential, and the size of the resources it needs to achieve higher living standards. The good news is that this new wave of needed Asia infrastructure investment can both help reduce climate change and enhance economic growth through creating a pan-Asian energy infrastructure. As it happens, bits and pieces of a highly efficient pan-Asian energy network are already taking shape. The task now is to recognize the pattern and fill in the missing links. Let's start by looking at Asia's existing infrastructure. These are Asia's power lines, these are the natural gas pipelines, and these are Asia's fiber optic cables. Now, let's look at what's planned or underway. Between now and 2025, China plans to build dozens of high-capacity power lines to bring low-emission energy like sun and wind from her western region to her eastern coastal cities. China is also expanding her domestic natural gas pipeline network and her telecommunication system. Meanwhile, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation States is deepening interconnections between its members' national electricity grids and natural gas pipelines. The aim is to bring online cleaner energy sources and to increase cross-border energy trade. What's more, several new fiber optic cables are also planned for the region. Some of these could be extended all the way to Australia. These will add, a, add to the fiber optic cables that already span the region. At present, all these new electricity, natural gas, and fiber optic projects in Asia are being planned and built independently. No one's talking to each other. The natural gas guys aren't talking to the electricity guys, and the electricity guys aren't talking to the telecoms guys. If they did talk, they'd find that they have a lot in common. That's because much of this infrastructure connects the same places, big cities. Building this new infrastructure together would reduce investment costs by laying multiple bits of infrastructure simultaneously. A further benefit would come from the synergies between telecommunications, gas pipelines, and power lines. Bundled together, they could create cloud energy. This would be energy that could, figuratively be speaking, be delivered to anywhere, from anywhere on the network. The template here is the cloud computing of the Internet. The benefits to all of us of that revolution have been indisputable. And this is a key point. Kilowatt hours of electricity and petajoules of natural gas are just packets of energy. In other words, they're little different than the packets of data that now, 24-7, get delivered from anywhere to anywhere over the internet. 
bundling telecommunications, natural gas pipelines, and power lines can create an internet of energy in Asia. The data internet has transformed all of our lives over the past 40 years. The energy internet can transform our lives over the next 40 years. Asia has a lot of renewable energy resources. Asia has sun. Asia has wind. Asia has hydro. Asia also has geothermal, biomass, and ocean energy. Collectively, these could power Asia with plenty left over. The challenge, then, is to make the transition from dirty fossil fuels to these new, low-emission energy sources. The good news is that markets and long-term thinking can do the work for us. Let's look in more detail at Asia's energy resources. The biggest are sun and wind. In terms of sun, no place beats Australia. The amount of sunlight falling on Australia is so great that the country could satisfy all of the world's energy demand with a solar plant of roughly this size in the outback. Of course, no one's going to build one that size, but smaller, scattered plants can be built. Australia's outback is unique for having a huge amount of both sunlight and flat land. This sunlight and flat land is a natural factor endowment bestowing unparalleled comparative advantage on Australia. Given this, Australia could, over the long term, export surplus solar energy to Asia. The International Energy Agency believes Australia could be satisfying 40% of its own electricity needs by concentrating solar power by 2050. The IEA also believes that exported so Australian solar power could satisfy 7% of Indonesia's electricity needs in 2050. And, once again, it's the International Energy Agency saying this. For its part, China has strong solar resources in its desert north and west. China's developing these. But China's biggest renewable energy resource is wind. China has enough wind to power its entire economy. China also has large offshore wind resources. These are located primarily in the East China Sea. Taken together, China and Australia's sun and wind could power Asia. But there's a hitch. Sun and wind are intermittent. The sun doesn't always shine. The wind doesn't always blow. But this is less of a problem than it may appear. That's because Asia also has large resources of hydropower and natural gas. China has a number of existing hydropower dams. Dozens more are proposed, both in China and in Southeast Asia and the Mekong states. In terms of natural gas, Australia is moving ahead to develop large natural gas supplies in Queensland and the Northwest Shelf. These will be shipped north to power natural gas power plants in China, Japan, and South Korea. There are also significant gas fields under development in the South China Sea and in Western China. Hydropower and natural gas plants can be switched on and off on short notice. Over time, these can provide load balancing to a regional Asian grid dominated by renewables. And this represents the core of a plan. Gas and hydro replace coal over the short term. Gas and hydro provide load balancing to renewables, primarily sun and wind, over the long term. In making the shift to a low emission future, everyone agrees coal's days are numbered. Coal is the dirtiest of all energy sources. The mainstream view is that between now and 2025, coal-fired power plants should be replaced with less polluting natural gas plants. This while renewable energy capacity ramps up off a small base. All of this will enable near-term greenhouse gas emission reductions by taking offline the dirtiest coal-fired power plants. Now all of this makes sense. That's because natural gas can act as a transition fuel to renewables. Over the short to medium term, natural gas can replace coal as a baseload power source. Over the long term, natural gas can act as a load balancing power source to offset renewable energy's intermittency. As national electricity grids across Asia become more interconnected, cross-border trading can enable the differing intermittencies of sun and wind to largely cancel each other out. The result would be a firmer percentage of reliable baseload power. Residual intermittency could be satisfied by using rapid response natural gas and hydro capacity. Natural gas and hydro are premium energy sources. Shifting them to their highest value use will better reflect their contribution to system stability. At present, these attributes are underpriced, providing baseload power. That's economically wasteful. The business case gets even better when you consider all of the other long-term energy sources that can be developed. These include biomass, geothermal, wave and tidal energy, and even ocean thermal energy. All of these are found along the routes a future pan-Asian energy infrastructure could take. And this would create a virtuous circle. Investment in developing renewable energy resources 
is enhanced by access to market, and the economics of new infrastructure is enhanced by the prospect of high-capacity utilization. So, how do we get from here to there? Well, firstly, we need to think long-term. The second thing we need to do is to evaluate current investments to see how well they fit into a longer-term vision. The good news is that a lot of developments are underway in Asia that fit this long-term view. In coming years, huge new natural gas supplies will come online in Asia. Much of those new gas supplies will come from Australia. These will be shipped northward to be consumed by China, Japan, and South Korea. This creates the challenge of how to transport all that gas in the most efficient way possible. The current plan is to build hundreds of billions of dollars of liquid natural gas, or LNG, capacity. LNG is created when natural gas is compressed hundreds of times, so it can be transported by specialized tanker. But this compression requires a lot of energy, and that compression creates greenhouse gas emissions. And greenhouse gas emissions are the very thing that LNG technology is supposed to reduce. Researchers in the United States have found that on an all-inclusive, life-cycle greenhouse gas emission basis, natural gas delivered to market as LNG may end up generating more greenhouse gases than the coal that it's supposed to replace. So, something's not right. In other words, LNG may be taking us backwards in the battle against climate change. Carbon pricing will expose these poor economics. We'll all pay the costs. Another drawback of LNG is its technological inflexibility. That's because LNG is only good for one thing. Compressing and uncompressing natural gas for shipment in single-use tankers between dedicated ports. As a result, all this LNG infrastructure currently planned for Asia will only be good for a few short decades. After that, it will be useless. That's wasteful. LNG is not a long-term technology. It will be written off and abandoned over the medium term, leaving behind industrial blight. What Asia needs is an energy infrastructure that can change as the industry changes. That makes natural gas pipelines a much more logical delivery infrastructure. Pipelines can be adapted to carrying other fuels. LNG can't. The downside of pipelines is that they cost more to build over long distances than LNG. But this is more than offset by their longer, useful lifespans. For instance, over time, pipelines built today can be adapted to carrying other energy, like hydrogen or biofuels. Some pipelines in Europe and Canada already do this. What's more, pipelines can backhaul carbon for geosequestration. Australian gas major Santos has suggested just that, proposing that Australian waste carbon be shipped by pipeline to the region around Moomba in South Australia for long-term burial underground. Carrying hydrogen, biofuels, and carbon are just three future uses for pipelines that LNG can't match. As technological innovation flourishes, more uses for pipelines may emerge. The key lies in having flexible infrastructure that can adapt. It's impossible to overstress that energy infrastructure built today needs to be flexible to change with the times. A lot is going to change in tomorrow's energy markets. Unfortunately, flexibility isn't a characteristic of LNG. If Asia becomes progressively interconnected by high-capacity power lines up and down the hemisphere, natural gas pipelines could be laid alongside. So could fiber optic cables. And if this bundling occurred, everyone would save money. That's because labor costs could be shared. Bundling infrastructure also makes sense because virtually all of it connects the same places, big cities. Given that trillions of dollars of new infrastructure of all kinds is needed in Asia, a trillion saved on infrastructure is a trillion that can be spent on something else, like education, health, or deepening rural electrification. This enhances economic growth, resulting in a virtuous circle. Let's spend a few more minutes on the cloud energy concept. It is the key underpinning the pan-Asian energy infrastructure idea. To explain the idea, let's use a concrete example in China. China now suffers electricity shortages. Some of these are caused by, to take one example, transport bottlenecks between coal mines and power plants. 
To solve that problem, China has taken the lead in building power plants that are located right by coal mines in order to reduce the miles the coal must travel before being made into electricity. China's first such plant is in Shaanxi province. In this case, the coal mine merely delivers its coal to a coal-fired power plant located right next door, and the electricity is sent by power lines down to China's coastal cities. This, instead of the coal being delivered by truck to a coal-fired power plant nearer the coast. Advances in long-distance power transmission technology is making this kind of thing possible. Now, zoom this idea up to Asia. Assume a frictionless network of electricity power lines, natural gas pipelines is in place, along with the fiber optics needed to transmit the trading, network management, and price signals to run such a system. To analyze the benefits, consider a hypothetical example. Instead of shipping natural gas to Asia, Australia could instead just ship value-added electricity. This could occur by Australia building gas-fired power plants in its northwest, near its offshore gas fields. Australia could then just export the electricity over power lines to China instead of the natural gas. This reduces complexity in the system. In reality, of course, Australia and China would not engage in strictly bilateral trade. That would be inefficient. Instead, each would buy available marginal supply from the nearest location. However, Australia's surpluses of electricity fed into the system would create a daisy chain of surpluses all the way up the system that would be passed along in a series of bilateral trades, resulting in surplus power available for China to buy from its nearest neighbor. A system like this is enormously flexible. For if power lines and pipelines were laid alongside each other connecting Australia and China, China could depending upon its day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour -hour energy needs, import either electricity or natural gas or some other fuel, like hydrogen, from a vast, aggregated Asian pool of marginal supply, all balanced out by the price mechanism. This creates a much more flexible and frictionless energy system. An aggregated system also would send better, more accurate price signals for overall new investment, and that would lower costs through greater efficiency. If you scale this transport and trading paradigm up to a market of 2 billion people, the overall potential efficiency gains are nothing short of mind-boggling. Putting it all together, it's possible to develop a vision of Asia as one big network. Solar energy and natural gas from Australia could flow northward. Wind energy from China could flow southward. Biomass, geothermal, hydro, and wind in Southeast Asia could flow both ways. The key lies in creating a ubiquitous regional transmission network. Asia now has a huge opportunity it can grasp. Asia can use its large infrastructure needs to build the interconnected foundations of a highly efficient energy infrastructure that could serve it well into the 22nd century. Asia needs to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Asia needs new infrastructure. Asia needs to replace aging coal-fired power capacity. And Asia needs to rebuild capacity destroyed by natural disasters. A pan-Asian energy infrastructure solves all these problems at the same time.